Hello and welcome to the Hijacker's Guide to the Galaxy, Off-Path Taking Over Internet Resources. I'm Philipp Jeitner and I'm one of the authors of this paper. So first, we will look at an overview. We will look at how, to, how digital resources and providers are managed and what type of resources and providers we need. Then we will look at how to take over those resource holders' accounts to hijack the resources in those accounts. We will look at how many vulnerable customers they are and what potential resource manipulations you could do when you have access to such an account. We look at the vulnerable resources and finally we will look at countermeasures and provide conclusions. So first, what type of digital resources and providers do we even need? Um, we mean essentially resources like domain names, internet addresses, so IP addresses, or certificates for TLS. Such resources are typically managed via providers and to manage such these resources, you have an account at the provider. So essentially it's the same as to log in into, an, into your email account, but here you log into an account which manages those resources, for example, which manages the IP address space. And if you, for example, want to sell the address space to someone else, you go to the account and tell the provider that you sold it. So for our data sets, we looked at four different types of resources. We looked at all the regional internet registries where you manage your IP address allocations. We looked at registrars like GoDaddy, where you manage your domain names and cloud providers like Google or Amazon, where resources like virtual machines and other cloud resources are managed. And finally, we look at certificate authorities where you manage TLS certificates, for example, you can renew them. And for our customer data set, we look at 75% of the customers of IRs and also the 100K top Alexa domain list. So the question is how to attack those providers and take over an account. Our attack works by hijacking the password recovery email for the account. And essentially, since emails uh, are routed through the DNS or the routing information for emails is stored into the DNS, our attack works by poisoning the DNS cache for the victim domain in the resource provider's resolvers with a poisonous entry which maps the email server of the victim to the attacker's IP address. The attacker then triggers a password recovery email for the victim domain or the victim account and resets the password for the account. This allows him to take over the account via essentially resetting the password and logging into the account. So the question is essentially how to poison the resource provider's resolver's cache. And to do this, there are several methodologies, but we evaluated three, which are BGP prefix hijacks, side channel attacks, uh, also called set DNS, and also IP fragmentation attacks. And we found that for the BGP subprefix and fragmentation attacks, most of the providers we tested are vulnerable to such an attack, while for the side channel attack, only some of the providers are vulnerable. So the other question besides the vulnerable providers are the vulnerable customers. For a customer to be vulnerable, essentially we have two properties which need to be fulfilled. First, the customer's account details which are needed to trigger the password recovery need to be somehow known to the attacker. And we find that since for the most providers you only need the email address of the account to trigger the password recovery, you can actually find these email addresses in 75% of the cases for the IRWhois accounts just from the public WhoIs databases because the public WhoIs databases lists many email addresses which belong to these uh, resources and one of them is certainly the email address which is linked to the account. The same applies to 11% of the Alexa 100k domains where the difference essentially comes from that in the case of domains, the details are typically um, privacy protected which is not the case for the IR who is databases. And even if this is not possible, the account identifier which needs to be entered into the web interface can often be guessed. For example, because the um, 
resource holder uses an email address like ipmanagement at provider.com or knock for um, knock at company.org. And the second property for a customer to be vulnerable is essentially the name server configuration of the domain which serves the or for the domain where the account email address is, is hosted. And depending on the poisoning methodology we evaluated, we find that 11 to 56% of the accounts are vulnerable to these attacks. So next we will look at what kind of manipulation of resources is possible under those providers. For our test case, we will look at the attacks which are managed via the SSO accounts of LARs on the RIPE NCC. And for such an account at RIPE NCC, we list different types of actions which the attacker can do once he has access over the account. First, the attacker could do could manipulate the RPKI status of the resources or the network blocks of the victim. Essentially, what he can do is he can create, remove, or modify existing root origin announcements, which means that he can either disrupt propagation of BGP announcements, or he can expose an already RPKI-protected network to BGP hijacking. The next thing the attacker could do is to manipulate the right database, so the WIS database, um, to either allow impersonation of the other representatives or to, for example, make other networks refuse BGP peerings of the customer because the BGP routers might use the data from the WHOIS to filter BGP announcements. Um, furthermore, the attacker could essentially change the user details of the account. So, for example, he can basically create new users under the same organization, which also have uh, which also have access to the same resources, and so they can still manage those resources even if the victim sees that the account has been hijacked and might reset the password. The attacker can also modify the other contacts or details, so he could even hijack essentially the post address of the LAR account and so even hard copies of, of contracts, etc. won't go to the correct address anymore. The attacker can also terminate the LAR membership, which would essentially delete all the customer's accounts, uh, resources. And finally, the attacker can also initiate a transfer of internet resource or address space blocks and essentially sell the address resources of the victim to another party. And this is especially effective if the attacker colludes with the buyer of the IP resources, because then it is easy to fake contracts which show that both the victim and the buyer essentially um, signed the contract, which is a requirement for the uh, transfer to be made. So you have to send a scan of a contract um, which is signed by both parties, but since such a scan might be easily forged, and in the case of a colluding, the buyer is even basically also the attacker, this is not really a different thing to do. We also evaluated other resource manipulations at other providers, for example, um, domain registrars, certification authorities, and cloud providers, which we list in the, in the paper. Finally, the question is how many resources are vulnerable to our attacks? So essentially, we looked at the IP addresses and domains and found that from the public rules records that even though not only 50, roughly 50% 50 of the accounts are vulnerable, roughly 80% of the IP addresses are vulnerable to our attacks because the bigger network blocks seem to be more vulnerable or the accounts which manage more IP resources seem to be often or more often vulnerable than small accounts. We also found that for domains, roughly half of the Alexa 100k domains are vulnerable to our attacks um, via BGP hijacks, which uh, is, is smaller for the other cache poisoning methodologies. Overall, we see that 93% of IP addresses and 
64%, uh, 65% of the domains are vulnerable to our attacks. So next, we provide recommendations for countermeasures. Our first category of countermeasures are measures who, to make it harder to take over the account. And these countermeasures are to hide public account details and to use separate systems for high-privileged accounts to make it harder for an attacker to actually get access to the system. The second set of countermeasures are aimed towards making it harder to manipulate resources. And the countermeasures we provide here are two-factor authentication, which should be enforced for all customers, account notifications for changes in the accounts, and access re restrictions. Additionally, a manual review process for high-value transactions might prevent attacks to actually complete. Finally, we will also provide conclusions. We conclude that the resource databases are poorly protected and that adversaries can take over the accounts and can manipulate the resources. We also saw that the attacks are relatively practical and that a large fraction of providers and customers are potentially vulnerable. Also, the attack is even interesting for on-path attackers, which have e already access to the DNS queries. And finally, we show that fixes exist, but they are not, not always enforced. For example, strict authentication via mandatory two-factor authentication might actually drive customers away and that might make the providers not make that mandatory. Finally, this was my presentation. Thank you and goodbye.